Welcome, everyone. All right, we're at 101. That's a good time to start. Uh, people can keep joining us, but we have an exciting and jam packed green quarantine to kick off our fall season here today. So we will get started. So welcome everyone. This is the start of season two after five weeks of a summer break that I hope um, all of you got to enjoy and hopefully safely got outside, maybe saw a little nature. Um, and now we are thrilled to be back. Um, so, and we are back with the one and only Emily O'Brien, who is the founder and CEO of Earth Angel. And I'm going to leave it all to her to explain the amazingness of Earth Angel while I, hold on, admit some people. Um, but Earth Angel is the leading sustainability consultancy for TV and film here in the U.S. Um, so we are truly honored to have you here with us today, Emily, and thank you for sharing so much with us. Um, certainly, we have so much to learn from each other as TV and film work together and certainly looking forward um, into what's next as we reopen. And I know as TV and film are already starting to come back. Um, and so you're gonna have some interesting things to share with us, I'm sure. Um, a few housekeeping things to get us started. Um, I see so many of you have popped your video on. Thank you. If you are able to in your circumstance and your access needs allow, it is great to see your faces. Um, this will be uh, an interactive conversational uh, session where uh, you will be welcome to ask questions throughout. So um, it's great to see you. Uh, in terms of questions, feel free to put questions in the chat as we go. Emily will be happy to take them. Um, please go ahead. We will ask you to say your questions again via voice. If for any reason you are not comfortable doing that, please again preface your question in the chat and I will be happy to read it for you. Uh, we do have um, live caption notes available. You should see that at the very top of your screen, um, Otter AI live notes. So if you need live captioning, uh, feel free to click on that. If you have any other access needs that we can help you accommodate, please feel free to reach out to me or our wonderful assistant director, Chrissy. Chrissy, if you want to give a wave um, and we'll be able to happy, help you. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, I'm Molly Bergman. I'm the director of the BGA. I use she, her. And we have a special birthday with us today. Uh, the co-chair of the BGA, Charlie, it is his birthday. So we can all give birthday wave. I'm not going to try to sing via, <laughs> um, via this. So very happy birthday, Charlie. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much, Molly, for having me and um, for everyone for joining today. Happy birthday, Charlie. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really thrilled to be here with you. Um, as Molly said, my, my background is in film and television, and I have been actively uh, working and trying to make the film and television industry more sustainable um, for about nine years now. Uh, but I know that there is so much overlap, of course, between these peer industries um, in the theater world as well. And I think there's a lot that we can uh, work together on to, to collaborate and sort of accelerate this uh, you know, transition of a overarching sustainable entertainment industry. So um, yeah, Molly, thank you so much again for having me and, and involving me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I've got a few slides I'm going to just share with you guys that kind of explain a little bit more about Earth Angel and what we do. So just bear with me while I uh, screen share with you all here. And okay. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, awesome. Um, so, uh, Earth Angel, as Molly said, we are a sustainability consulting agency dedicated to greening the uh, film, television, and we also work on commercial productions and uh, live events. Uh, tagline of making movies without making a mess, but as we, I just mentioned, we sort of broaden it um, in all sort of facets of, of entertainment as well. Um, so a little bit about me and my background. So I'm a filmmaker by training. I graduated from NYU's Tisch film program and uh, really wanted to help make socially environmentally conscious content. Um, so I was uh, sort of determined to go to the documentary route for quite some time and uh, really help leverage this super powerful medium to try to accelerate solutions around 
climate, social justice, et cetera. Uh, and then shortly after my, my first experience working in the film industry, um, it sort of dawned on me that the uh, process of making content is actually very wasteful. Uh, and so I started to look into what solutions were, um, you know, currently existed. And I discovered that there were some initiatives that had started. Um, the Producers Guild of America had started a green committee. Um, and through that, they had created some best practices guides and so forth. So we had some sort of overarching guidelines, but there was really this disconnect between you know, what was happening in, in terms of like a corporate studio policy versus what you were seeing on set every day. Um, and so it was around this time, about 2011, that um, studios were starting to hire individuals to quote unquote green the set. And I, I got wind of this and I immediately sort of thought, how can I do this? This sounds amazing. Like, how, what, what, what does one do to, to become a greener of a set? And so I uh, reached out to my network. Um, I found a producer who was willing to hire me to take a chance on me to say, sure, we'll, we'll have you be like a production assistant level role. See what you can do. See what happens. Um, and out of that, I had all of this phenomenal experience and these takeaways about, you know, we were only scratching the surface. Um, and through that, uh, other producers sort of started to call me and say, hey, can you come green my set? Can you come green my set? And it sort of grew organically in that way. Um, and so the main thing I want to kind of drive home here is that, you know, I was motivated to do this because, you know, I was uh, really trying to practice sustainability in my, in my lifestyle and, and the way that, um, you know, that I just conducted my everyday life. And I noticed that there was a lot of people in our industry who also lived that lifestyle, who also lived a low impact life of, you know, reducing meat consumption and composting at home and, you know, making sure that they were as ener energy efficient as possible. But then somehow when they got to set, it was like the, uh, a, fl a, you know, switch had flipped and it was like, all of a sudden we weren't as responsible in our place of work. Um, and so I, I noticed that there was a lot of just like, how do I do this? How do I adapt? And we really wanted to try to create solutions um, for crew members, the sort of crew first mentality. Uh, and so really I was kind of inspired and compelled by, um, if you don't know Mary Hagler, who's a climate essayist, she's phenomenal. I follow her and she does great work. Um, but she had this essay that she put out um, about a year ago that basically talks about the systemic problems around climate change and about how it's great that we're all making personal strides to reduce our impact, um, but we can't stop there, right? We have to look at like, what are the systemic challenges? And so for me personally, that was looking at my industry. How, do, how do, can we sort of make these changes within my sector specifically where I, I feel most compelled that I can make a difference? Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the filmmaking process, uh, it can be very, very wasteful. Um, so this was a, an image that was taken on um, a production that I worked on back in 2013, um, where we shut down Park Avenue for uh, days at a time. Um, and we just wrecked a lot of cars and we wreaked a lot of havoc, essentially. Uh, and you know, this is, this is a sort of extreme case. I will, I will say that like not every production features, uh, crazy stunts and car chase sequences and so forth. Um, but every production does have a nuanced, um, and very custom in, uh, environmental impact. Um, so maybe that's, they're constructing a lot of sets and using a lot of lumber, um, to, you know, build that particular set. Uh, maybe that's we're shooting in six different countries over the course of that production. And so we're just flying a lot to get crew members and cast members around. Um, and so we try to really take a customized approach to each individual show and say, okay, this is a show that's going to have a really big transport footprint. What can we do to help mitigate that? Or this is going to have a really big waste impact. What can we do to help mitigate that? Um, so that's always something that's top of mind for us. Uh, some stats for you. Uh, on average, one New York City um, production, uh, so this is like a mix of film and television, um, is currently averaging about 1,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent, producing about 250 tons of waste, uh, consumes around 64,000 single-use plastic water bottles, 
Um, and the real kicker here is that they're wasting over $150,000 just on simple, inefficient uh, protocols. So that could be something as simple as like, they have way more dumpsters than they need and they're paying to have them uh, you know, emptied when they're not actually full. Um, or perfectly good material that could be getting donated uh, is instead getting landfilled. Um, or too much energy is being consumed than what we actually really need. Um, or generators being run, for example. Uh, so we have a really strong emphasis on um, metrics and analysis because a huge issue right now is that we can't, we don't really have a lot of quantifiable numbers that we can point to to illustrate the, the impact of our industry. And so here's some of the unique challenges for us in film, television, and commercial. Um, the first challenge is that we're traveling circus. Um, so this, uh, you know, certainly I think you encounter this when um, shows go on tour, right? You're moving from place to place a lot too in the theater world. Um, but I think this is really sort of uh, an, an ultra challenge for us, um, and especially in New York, because we do a lot of um, company moves even where we're shooting in multiple locations in one day. Um, and so we could start our day in lower Manhattan and then we could end our day in Brooklyn, for example. Um, and so we're covering a lot of ground. And so we have to make sure that our solutions are mobile. Um, that we're not just creating something that's going to work for one circumstance or situation, but our waste bin receptacles, for example, are going to be applicable if we are shooting in a state park or if we are shooting in an enclosed soundstage. Um, so all of those types of nuances come into play. Uh, we're also an industry of freelancers. Um, so we have this rotating, um, you know, uh, labor force. And so while I think you know we've come a long way and we're seeing crew members now really understand when they come onto a set, they're like, oh, it's a green set, I get it. I'm bringing a reusable water bottle, there's gonna be composting. You know, We're starting to see that learning curve really take shape, which is really exciting. But nevertheless, um, we could have crew members who are just there or background actors who are just there for like one particular day who aren't necessarily accustomed to the systems and the protocols that we put into place. So in that regard, we're sort of constantly educating, like we are constant educators. Um, the other piece of it is that we don't have a lot of publicly available data on what the environmental impact of our industry is. Um, there was a 2006 UCLA study that essentially put the Los Angeles film and television sector's footprint on par with that of the aerospace industry um, in Los Angeles. And that was sort of like a big catalyst report, the first real academic study that had come out about our impact. Um, and then since then, of course, there's a lot of focus on studios collecting and analyzing this information, but it's really, really hard to find quantifiable data that is publicly available for, for people to see that impact. So that's definitely a challenge for us too, is the, the lack of transparency and disclosure. Um, and then lastly, there's this real psychological hurdle that I like to talk about that I think isn't really talked about enough, um, which is this concept that we refer to as cinematic immunity, um, which essentially kind of boils down to this idea of like a lot of people who I think work in arts and entertainment and certainly really high profile projects where there's a lot of star power and things like that, um, just tend to kind of operate as though they're above the rules, as though they sort of live in this bubble of their set and that they don't have an impact on the outside world, which is of course not the case. Um, and so our fight to make the film industry more environmentally sustainable is really the same fight as making it more, is increasing our health and safety standards and our labor standards or our uh, gender racial equality um, and inclusivity issues in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, all of these are aligned of course in, in sustainability because it's about the people, planet and the profit um, and, and making all of those things work together um, in a holistic solution. Um, so that's a really big psychological behavioral burden, burden um, sorry, that we have to um, constantly address and, and really start to be more vocal about calling out. Um, there are some great resources out there in terms of like what the US standards are. Um, the Green Production Guide, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, greenproductionguide.com has amazing resources in terms of like 
these action checklists broken down by department. I'm sure some of which are definitely translate into the theater world. Um, and then we also use as our way of calculating our carbon footprint, a tool called the PAIR, which stands for Production Environmental Accounting Report. Um, so these are sort of like the pillars of how we are saying what is sustainable, um, how we're tracking that, uh, and, and so forth. So this is a great resource guide um, for those who aren't familiar. So our solution specifically with Earth Angel is about, you know, we're focused on providing production level consulting service. We also work at the studio level and we also work with facilities. So sound stages um, and any of the sort of infrastructure that, uh, you know, comes into play with, with our, our work. So um, we're kind of looking at all these different stakeholders. Uh, we also have a service that we call our Good Riddance um, Material Repurposing Service. So when one of our shows or films um, decides they're done for the season or they're striking and they're picture locked and they don't need to hold anything anymore, um, we'll then go into those storage units and we'll help responsibly repurpose a lot of that material um, through our nonprofit partners and uh, other arts organizations, small businesses, uh, you name it, just trying our best to keep it out of landfills, essentially. Um, and then lastly, our, our eco labs, which are our trainings and workshop programs. So we do these, we've done these globally all over the world um, for different film festivals or, uh, com you know, film offices or commissions. Um, we also have an eco PA training program um, that we uh, have also spearheaded. So a lot of different types of services that we offer. Um, here's just a glimpse at some of the projects that we've worked on from The Amazing Spider-Man 2 um, to uh, we've gone as far as Africa when we worked with Disney on the Queen of Cotway. We worked in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, we worked on, uh, you know, TV shows, some really popular TV shows like Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Madam Secretary. Um, so really proud of our, our work that we've done. Um, we are largely New York focused. Um, we are headquartered in New York, but we have uh, since started uh, expanding services into Los Angeles and um, Atlanta as well. And so our model really boils down to these four, our four S's as we call it. So when people say, how do you green a film set? Um, we say we, we uh, provide the four S's, um, which is the strategy, the staff, the stuff, and the stats to help production reduce its environmental impact. So the strategy piece is really, how do we translate the language of sustainability into the language of production, right? Because if you just kind of start talking carbon at people, <laughs> you tend to lose them. Um, you know, you have to meet people where they are. Um, the conversation that I'll have with someone in the camera department is very different than a, a conversation I would have with the catering department, for example. Um, and so we have to understand their, you know, their workflows, uh, their, uh, you know, the behavioral psychology of what's going into all of these things, and then try to offer realistic solutions and support. Um, so we really try to shy away from this, like, top-down prescriptive approach of just kind of finger pointing and telling people what to do, but really, like, doing it with them and understanding what the challenges are and the troubleshooting that has to go into it. Um, the staff, as I mentioned, is our eco-production assistant program. So we recruit, train, staff, supervise eco-PAs, on our productions. These are the boots on the ground folks who are setting up composting and recycling bins, setting up water dispensing stations to move away from single use plastics. Um, and so the, this, uh, they're really the heart and soul of our program and I think what people know, know us best for. The stuff is our, uh, all of our eco supplies, bins, um, you know, you name it. We, we rent that out to productions to help, uh, you know, just streamline the process of getting what they need. Um, and then of course, all the material repurposing at the end. And then the stats is all of our reporting and analytics. So carbon footprint assessment, um, environmental impact reporting, lots of different metrics that we report on. So here's just some visuals of what that looks like. Um, our green glove is sort of our cultural symbol at Earth Angel. Um, and so we, uh, you, you see that a lot sort of like throughout our um, website and materials. Um, and it's fun because there's a lot of different departments, of course, on a film set, and you can kind of identify what department is who based on what they carry, like on their tool belt or on their whatever. And so the green gloves have sort of like now been the identifier of the sustainability department or the eco department, which is really fun. So that's a little, um, uh, just a little visual aid that we're finding really helps people identify what, what it is we're there to do on set since it is 
sometimes new for folks still. Uh, quick question uh, yeah. from Susan about staff. Susan? I just wanted to know how many how many people do you normally add on to a film? In other words, when you come in on a film, are you adding five people? Or are you adding how many people are normally? Great question. So in terms of our eco PAs, um, it's typically one eco PA per production, unless that production has, let's say, a scene where there are hundreds of extras and background actors that you know will now be producing a lot more recycling and compost, you know, waste management that we're gonna have to oversee. Um, this is also, of course, shifting in the, you know, wake of being sustainable on set during a pandemic too. Um, there's a lot of new like zoning requirements that are coming out where um, only certain people can be in certain places on the set. And um, so because of that, there will probably be like additional um, PAs that will have to service. But then we also have our internal Earth Angel team that always inevitably touches the project in some way. So I have a dedicated person who oversees all the analytics for, um, for our shows. And so while she is not on the set physically, um, you know, she's tracking all the numbers and putting together the reports remotely. Um, so she is still you know, involved with the project. Same with our materials coordinator who supports with all the donation work. Um, you might not see her physically on set every day, but she is coordinating um, remotely from, from afar. So I would say the physical presence on set would be anywhere from like one to three people on average, something along those lines. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and so just some stats in terms of what, what's been achieved. Um, so over the, the course of the nine years, I've been working on this uh, initiative, we have avoided over 6,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent, um, reduced over 3,000 tons of waste um, from landfills, avoided, we actually just crossed the 2 million mark, so that's, this needs to get updated, which is very exciting. So over 2 million single-use plastic water bottles, and we've helped save the shows um, over a million dollars, gross savings across all the mm, 50 productions, I would say, we've, we've serviced now. Um, so really trying to show them the cost benefit of, you know, these, these sustainable actions as well. And just some like quick barriers to adoption that I think are, are still a challenge, even though, you know, I've been working on this for nine years, there's still a lot that we need to overcome, of course. Um, so it really just boils down to motivation and misconception. Um, we don't have certain motivating factors like regulatory compliance. There's no one forcing us to disclose um, our, our environmental impact and thus no regulatory agencies or bodies, um, you know, mandating that we follow certain procedures. Uh, there's no fiscal incentives for productions to do this currently besides, you know, the basic cost saving measures of, you know, if you have more energy efficient infrastructure, you're going to save on your energy bills, but there isn't uh, any type of government agency saying, if you take X sustainability measures, you can get Y financial uh, rebate or incentive. Um, and then another big one is uh, consumer demand. So where you're seeing the rise of uh, sustainable industries, like uh, you know more consumers demanding sustainable food or sustainable fashion options, um, no one in an audience at home, like watching their their film or television series, is going to choose to watch something because it was produced sustainably. Um, so we don't have the consumer demand lever to pull like a lot of other industries are seeing, which is a challenge. Um, then of course, there's just a lot of misconception. It's too hard. It costs too much money. Uh, where do I start? You know, all of those types of things that we're really constantly trying to to alleviate and, and kind of debunk those myths a little bit. All of that being said, there has been enormous interest, um, really I would say over the past year, this has accelerated and this conversation has really taken shape um, within our, our industry trades, um, but then even beyond that. Um, so big headline articles about you know, how our industry has an impact and what we're doing to combat that. Um, Variety is even hosting this series in September. Um, it just started yesterday, but there's two more coming up for those are, who are interested about sustainability in Hollywood. 
Um, so there's a lot of pressure. There's a magnifying glass now, I think, on our industry, which I think is a, there's a lot to say for that in terms of like the speeches that we've seen, you know, at award ceremonies from a lot of like very influential uh, folks in the industry and actors to Greta Thunberg and, you know, the, the rise of youth activism. I think this is sort of like, we're seeing this groundswell of um, attention being paid to it, which I, I think is a really important piece in terms of a, a motivating factor here. And so that's it. That's, that's kind of a, the gist of what we do and how we do it. Um, this is all of our information and um, we'd love to, I, I really want to hear people's questions. I could talk forever, um, but I would love to sort of just hear from folks um, what they're more interested in uh, in hearing about, and then I'll, um, I'll go from there, I guess. But yeah, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, if you want to unscreen share, maybe we can join ourselves in the, in, there we go. We can all see each other now. Excellent. Um, I think if, if people have questions, they can, we're small enough, people can unmute and call themselves into the space. I have one. Um, Emily, thank you so much. This is really, really helpful. Um, we have, I'm on a big show, it's Wicked, and we have a lot of things that are in storage that during this period we're actually going through and kind of culling and downsizing and that sort of thing. But is that something that Earth Angel could actually do is to come into our storage facilities and help us figure out where are things going? How? Like, there's nobody right now. I guess the BGA is kind of who would be that organization, but we really don't have anybody there. And so do you think that's something that Earth Angel might consider helping our community with working with the bigger shows in terms of disposal of big sets and physical productions? Certainly, yeah, that's that's definitely in line with our, our good riddance program that I mentioned. Um, so it's, it's really not any different from us going into a television series storage, you know, unit than uh, a Broadway show storage unit. It's still, we're dealing with very sort of eclectic items, which we're very used to seeing and, and trying to figure out solutions for, for those. Um, what, I guess one question I have to maybe to you, Molly, or to the group in terms of, cause, the, and this is just, you know, apologies, my ignorance and know how the, the theater landscape functions, but, um, I guess normally, like if a if a a show is um, striking or um, deciding to do a clear out or something, do you have a sort of like internal network that's established where you can easily like exchange? Um, you know, maybe Wicked is giving this away, and I don't know, Phantom wants it for some reason. Like I I don't know if that ever happens, but like we see that happen a lot in our in our community, I'm wondering if that ever happens for you guys. Molly, can I take that? Please. <laughs> um, so here's what's happened traditionally. Traditionally, when shows close, especially if the next show that's coming in knows that they're coming in next, there's a lot of communication between the shows saying, we're getting rid of this, this, and this, do you want them? And those are the easy ones. Those are the ones that are, are very easy. We've been trying to establish for many years what we call a closing green program where there would be something if we knew in time where we would basically say, let's say the last, um, the last uh, loadout, the last week before the loadout, we would have almost an open house for prop houses and set shops and other, and other theaters to come take a look at what we have, what we're planning to throw away and offer to take them. Um, we have never actually managed to pull that off, but it is certainly in our, on our list of things we would like to do. And it would be interesting to have a discussion with you guys about could you help us kind of establish that kind of program because our problem has been both not having the storage and not having the personnel to actually make those programs happen. The other thing we've been trying to do, and again, we're not there yet, but we've tried to do is put it on the tech supervisors that the last thing they do before, it, when the show opens, is to come up with a disposal plan of what will happen at the end of the show so that there are options of we might rent out, you know, there might be a tour and we would reuse the production 
or there might be a license and we would you know put things away or in storage or we might be getting rid of things and how do we how do we quantify those things in advance so when we only get one week's notice that the show is closing we don't have to then scramble of what are we going to do with all the stuff Valerie, I see you smiling. I mean, that's that's really that's what happens all the time, is that we don't get enough notice to put the plans in order. So our goal had been to come up with the plans at the time we open, when the information is fresh of what do we own, what do we rent, what have we bought, and we can come up with several scenarios so that when we have to pull the trigger, the scenarios are already figured out. So that hasn't happened yet, but that is certainly the that's been kind of a big plan for us to work on for a long time. And um, you know, I've been aware of your existence. You know, we've never really heard a program that maybe Earth Angel could help us with. Um, but that's the the truth is we don't we don't do this well enough. And even though we've managed to keep much more out of landfill than we thought we were doing because there are some carting companies that actually take these things and dispose of them properly. We don't have really a formatted um, program in place to do this really properly. So that's importantly and see if maybe, maybe it's time to put that program into place when we come back. Gotcha. Oh, Charlie, go ahead. I think you're muted. Even better, um, we have a we have a guide that I think. Charlie, you're muted. Now am I am I still muted? No, you're good now. Yeah, you're fine. Great. So we have a guide that I think we shared with you in 2017 when we were doing that green festival thing at the um, I forget where that was that seven people showed up for. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, a. a a guide to closing green it does like you were talking about a few minutes ago identify obstacles time storage money planning etc emphasizes so we have we've got material that is helpful that has resources um, that it was developed primarily by our off-broadway community but um, it has the all the usual suspects we've done uh, we, when someone knows that they want to find a second home for their materials, we list things on our cube. We have good relationships with Material for the Arts and all the, you know, big reuse and all the other likely suspects. So we've facilitated various things, but on a one-off basis. And when the last time we did an actual specific quantified study, we found that between 85 and 95 percent of the materials of closing shows were uh, didn't end up in landfill, were either reused or, or recycled. The problem is we, uh, uh, we do much better on the proper disposal rather than the reuse, and reuse obviously is way better than just having uh, proper disposal. So this is a, kind of an, as Susan was saying, an ongoing, um, uh, ongoing struggle with the sort of five factors that make it, that make it hard: timing, money, uh, storage, mismatches, lack of information, etc. So um, we're 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 engaged with that, but it, I don't think we've gotten it quite right yet either. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Bridget. Bridget, you want to jump in and ask? Um, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know, uh, in response to COVID-19, are there, have there been some major changes? Like, what are you seeing uh, that's different? Yeah, great question. You? So, um, First, there, the Green Production Guide did release a um, kind of return to work sustainably, um, a, you know, one sheet that is sort of like a response to a lot of the return to work guidelines we were seeing from like IOTC and, and the other unions and so forth. Um, 
with some suggestions about how you can, uh, you know, still maintain your sustainability programs while also complying with the new health and safety protocols. Um, we have not yet deployed our program on a like set post pandemic yet. Um, so that is still something that is an ongoing work in progress. We have our production that's due to, to start the soonest is going to be coming up here in late September. And so we are strategizing essentially like with the new health and safety departments within each production saying like, here, here's our thought process and what we have in mind, making sure that's in compliance with like their new zoning protocols or their new disinfecting protocols. Um, and we actually see a lot of opportunity because it's very, very rare that you have an opportunity to like rewrite an industry's rules, which is essentially what's happening right now. And so our main uh, objective is to rewrite them, but like also not lose sight of the sustainability progress that we've made and actually can we enhance them. And so like an example of that is everyone's really afraid of reusables right now, even though if you look at the facts and the numbers, like reverting to single use plastics, like the virus actually lives longer on plastic than other surfaces. You know, like there's all these like nuances as to why the perception is that it's safer, but in reality it, it isn't necessarily. And so we actually see opportunity to double down on reusables and like, will we need to have very strict, you know, touchless water dispenser stations? Absolutely. To, to be able to do that and it be monitored and wiped down regularly, like to ensure for sure, you know, all of those things. But we actually see opportunity now to even go into like, can we be using more reusable dishware than we were using before with catering and craft service and like actually bringing in a, a dishwashing service to, to help support with that, that would then be sort of cost neutral to the amount of disposables we're going to now have to pay for. Like it's going to, the amount of disposables, the cost for that is going to be way higher. The cost of waste hauling is going to be way higher because we're going to be producing more waste. So, you know, it's all about kind of doing this strategizing and, um, logistics to, to kind of sort out all of the nuances of it, which is sort of like what we are in the thick of right now. Um, and then lastly, I'll say the other thing that I think is really important in terms of the wake of, of COVID compliance is really pushing for emissions free generators. Um, Cause obviously there's this really strong connection between the air quality and COVID case rates and death rates. And so where we can have our sets be like completely away, moving away from diesel generators um, and, and really doubling down on this new technology, we're really trying to emphasize that right now too as a transition because previously that transition was really hard because people were like, oh, I have to learn a new piece of equipment. I have to whatever. And it's like, well, now you have plenty of time to learn a new piece of equipment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, some of these like excuses are sort of like, moving away more and more so like we actually have opportunity to kind of pilot things and um you know and and set a new standard so um so i will say that to your question bridget and then i i want to just double back really quick to the um disposing of materials um question too just because something else came to mind um the number one issue that we are we get in our industry which i'm also hearing is the same in yours is like storage time money personnel. Um, and so those are the same across the board. One of the initiatives we've been working on for some time now is we have a relationship with the mayor's office of meat entertainment. Um, and we helped them launch their NYC film green program, which is basically like a designation program that if certain films or television shows meet sustainability criteria, they can qualify to get this seal in their end credits, which is like fine and good. Um, but we were really trying to encourage the mayor's office to actually help support with the infrastructure needed for shows to shoot more sustainably. And so one of those ideas would be, could the city potentially back or sponsor like a materials for the arts type facility, but really for scenery and set pieces? Because those are the hardest to deal with items that unfortunately materials for the arts won't accept big reuse won't accept and they are the heaviest they are the 
uh, you know, most difficult uh, to transport. Like it's just, there's an immense need for this type of material specifically. Um, and so we just did a whole case study um, that we put together for the mayor's office that um, we're hoping will be made public very soon to really emphasize like if the city backed something like this, here's how multiple industries would benefit from something like this. So certainly the theater world, the film and television world, the live events world, um, a lot of different folks could benefit from something like this that would help alleviate some of those pain points that, that we were just talking about. So fingers crossed, we can really advocate for it. It's gonna be really challenging, of course, because the city budgets are just getting slashed left and right. Um, so I, I don't know how promising this will be in terms of the near future, but it is something we're really trying to advocate for. Emily, if you need any input from either any of our designers or our set shops, I'm sure we could make that happen for you. Amazing. So just, just let us know, okay? Fantastic, thank you. So that concept is almost like a LEEDS certification, mm -hmm. right? Like you use certain materials and maybe, okay, that's... That's yeah. Right. yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a, it's a program that I think, you know, it was launched by our former film commissioner, Julie Menon. We now have a new commissioner. So I think the, the program itself needs work. You know, it's like, it's, it's something that is, we were, we had our contract, uh, you know, renewed so that we could specifically help improve the program. Um, because with the turnover of leadership, it's really challenging to, you know, see the program be maintained and, and optimized. So, so hope, fingers crossed, we can sort of see that improve a little bit more. Really exciting. Thank you, Emily. There, there's, um, it may be that the hybrid path on that is to get city space, which may be in greater supply, if we could figure out a way to have the labor to uh, work with it. So the space may be, space may be more available now than it was before um pe people not so much absolutely yeah that that was really our in our analysis that we did with the study we looked at we looked at examples from other major cities so there's a there's an example of this working in los angeles and vancouver and in london so those were mainly the ones we looked at and every single situation they there was some type of outside economic support that kept this facility running. It just, the economics of it don't work without some form of support. Um, and so that was really our main point that we made was like if the city could lend the space so that they, you know, rent is not a challenge, but there could still be operating costs that could be covered. You know, you can still charge, for example, for, you know, if you did want to sell things back, if you did want to have a drop off fee for certain size materials or whatever, as long as it's less money than a, than a dumpster at the end of the day, that's still a better alternative. Like there's still ways that this can support itself in terms of the labor that it would, it would need. But, you know, as we saw very tragically with film biz recycling, for those of you who, who knew about film biz recycling when that existed, you know, it just couldn't keep its doors open because of the cost of rent. And so, um, you know, we, we do need some type of uh, ideally city support to, to make something like that work again. I think that's the example of big reuse also, is yeah. there, it's just, um, the question is whether free rent would um, be sufficient to turn it in from modestly unprofitable to break even. Yeah. It might, it might. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. All right. Um, I want to uh, throw to um, Valerie's question. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank Bridget for bringing up the COVID question. Bridget is actually on our BGA task force on a greener reopening. So thank you for thinking deeply on that. And I know, Valerie, you have another question on that topic. Um, it, it's just that uh, we have a lot of things in the theater industry that are seem durable. But once we use them, they are no longer able to be re reused. They're all, the only option is either disposing or recycling. But do you, do you, 
is there anything in the film industry that is sort of standard about sending those things? Like when you smash cars, you're just done? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, they get taken to scrap metal facilities, you know, they're going to get picked apart and um, that metal is definitely getting recycled and, and so forth. So that that's one, you know, example. Um, we are, there are things that we encounter like that too, though, I think mainly in the scenery and the set design world that are, they're just so unique and custom. Um, it's really hard to find uh, any other situation that it would work in besides what it was constructed to, to do. Um, you know, things that are easy are flats, you know, there are normal sort of like eight by eight, eight by 10 flats. Like we, we can repurpose those really, really easily. Um, people will just paint over them and make them whatever they want. Um, as long as there isn't any like super strange fixtures uh, attached to them, you know, windows and doors, we repurpose super easily. Um, even a lot of times like molding and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, we had, we had this one, a great example is like, we had this staircase, the st spiral staircase that was built. Um, and that we, we were doing a storage clear out of, and we tried everything to figure out how, like, could we repurpose this staircase? And we just couldn't find a home for it. We, we couldn't find anyone who could use it with these spe very specific specs that it was built for. And I mean, it was metal, so it did get recycled, but yeah, there are some things like that that are just... And part of it, I think, is, you know, and specifically, I was thinking about things like aircraft cable. We go through so much aircraft cable, you would not believe. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it once we use it, we can't use it for the kind of things we're using. But I don't know if there's anybody else who uses it for without the ratings that it needs. That's a great question. And that's almost something where is there like an upcycling opportunity um, or something like that? Like, for example, there's this great company that we started working with that takes billboards and um, the like vinyl uh, uh, step and repeats and stuff for events um, and then like turns those into bags, you know? So that's like a very, very specific company that like now takes that material and does that. Um, so it's almost like you need for something like that. And, and we run into this situation too, with like gaff tape, like, what do you do with gaff tape once it's been used and like ripped up? Like how do, like, there are some things that are just really, really hard unless you have that, uh, ingenuity of, of someone who's like, I'm going to just create a whole new product line with something like that. Um, yeah, that's where we need, we need more, uh, engineers and um, uh, upcycling enthusiasts, I think. But Valerie, to answer yeah. your question, we've done things like with um, gels from lights, mm -hmm. where we basically, when, we're, when we change them out every six months, we can't use them anymore, but there's still life in those gels. Right. And we've done programs with high schools and colleges to give them to them because they only need them for five to ten performances so there is another five to ten performances left in those gels we just can't use them right so you know we, there could be more programs like that if we had the if we had the bandwidth to do them but those are some of the kinds of things that we've done from time to time when we can give it to a school like Wagner College has taken several things from us in the past where we've had things that that have life left in them it's just we can't use them anymore right and so we have partnered with some colleges to try to get them to take them and when we can it, it's great brilliant brilliant yeah. yeah we've seen similar success with with our gels or like our bounce board giving those to film schools and um and smaller organizations for sure that's that's always a great way to go because you'd be surprised what they can use <laughs> You know, like we think it's like, there's no way this could be used. And they're like, this is great. Thank you so much. Like, this is my whole budget, you know, for my, my uh, student film now covered, you know. I want to make sure we have time to get to Lauren's question, but Charlie, I see you. I, I, well, let's do Lauren's question first. Are you sure? Yeah, sure. Lauren, go ahead. 
Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for joining us, first of all. And then second of all, I just wanted to ask, so I know you talked about earlier, like adopting a kind of crew first mentality. So my question is really about like the actors, like do the actors follow the same sort of sustainability guideline as, guidelines as the crew members or are there kind of different guidelines set up for like different departments? Great question. Um, so most of the time the actors are super enthusiastic about our sustainability program. Like they're so into it. Um, we even actually launched our ambassador program because of that. So there are certain actors that were just like really over the moon about the fact that we were associated with our set and were like, you guys need to be on more sets and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's how we got Taya Leone and Bobby Cannavale and, and Megan Boone are all our Earth Angel ambassadors, for example. And um, the, the protocols aren't really different. We might just have to have some more sensitivity when we're dealing with the actors, you know? So for example, setting up a water dispenser in an actor's trailer for them to have, you know, water available that isn't bottled, um, you know, there might just be like specific nuances that we have to deal with in, in respect to that. Or, um, you know, sometimes like actors in, in, or, in order to keep their reusable bottles on them when they're traveling from a trailer to the set or their green room to the set, you know, talking about like whether it's their assistant or it's their costumer or it's like one of the first team PAs who deals with actors but like being mindful of making sure that bottle follows them for example like there's like specific things like that that we we navigate um we also really try to get the actors to um you know uh, exemplify these practices because if crew see them taking this seriously like they're more likely to take it seriously. Um, so we had, for example, like Tay Leone just made it that she wanted her cast vehicle to be a Tesla in our last season of Madam Secretary. She was like, this is important to me. This is this is what, what I want. So like, they have a lot of power and influence and leverage. And I think sometimes don't even know that there are questions they could be asking or, um, you know, initiatives they could they could really help launch um, just by asking the right question. So uh, we, we try to involve them as much as we can with these, these conversations because they just, you know, they're, they're listened to a lot more than, for example, someone like me on a production is listened to. Like that's just the sort of reality of the situation. Um, but yeah, they're, they've been historically really, really pro and active about it for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Riley. So I, I know we're uh, I know we're running towards the end of the time and some of what some of what I'm gonna bring up might be worth following up on offline. Um, uh, I had sort of two quest two quick questions and then uh, then a harder one. Um, the quick question was it, you estimated about a thousand tons carbon footprint for the average production. Uh, a Broadway show um, has a footprint of, you know, between four and 500 tons per year as, on average. Um, uh, and I'm wondering what, uh, what the top two or three components of the thousand tons are, because um, sure. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to keep it really simple, it's it's transportation and it's energy um, is really what it boils down to. Uh, we use an enormous amount of fuel and we uh, just in our trucks and trailers to get around in that traveling circus. And, uh, and we typically fly a lot of people. We're flying actors to and from LA and New York a lot um, usually. And, and then of course, like the energy consumption to physically power the sets you know, especially if we're doing like an overnight, an exterior overnight scene, like there's going to be a, a ton of power that's going to have to go into that. So um, those are the, the heavy hitter categories that we see consistently. That, that makes sense for why it would be twice, because for a sitting production, you don't have transportation and you have grid energy versus um, far less efficient diesel and other generators. So that makes sense. Second, um, have, uh, has, uh, have you included offsets as um, part of the program for the, um, if, if by doing a greener set, 
it goes down from 1200 to a thousand, you've still got the thousand. Um, is is where do office offsets fit in the mix? So offset, the decision to offset is made at the studio level, traditionally. So we essentially, we put the report together for them. We say it was 1200, now it's 800 or whatever we were able to reduce by. And then if they decide to offset, you know, we will present options of credible offset partners because of course you have to be really careful about that when you're navigating offsets. Um, some studios also just do that in turn, like they just take all of their productions throughout the entire year and just will do one big blanket offset rather than like production by production. Um, so it really just depends on the corporate studio policy procedure. We would love to get to a point to just like blanket offset every single production we work on. But right now there's just too many variables and nuances to be able to like budget for it and say like on average, it's going to be this much per production. It's just, it's too radically different right now, unfortunately. Emily, for the NYC film credit, do, is it require offsets? Is that part of it or? It does not require offsets. No, okay. it's, a, it's an extra credit thing. You can get extra credit for. We, you know, we say consider this, but it is not required. Got it. Okay. So the teaser that uh, I'd love to have more of a conversation with uh, offline is um, we've been, uh, I think, collectively very affected by the climate restoration conversation, emphasizing that it is not sufficient to slow the pace of destruction, that we actually have to become climate positive, that is, offsetting more than is produced, that the goal of carbon neutrality is insufficient and not able to be estimated the way you were talking about in advance. And so we are working on, we were very optimistic about 2020 before all the, uh, everything went down the tubes, um, that we were going to be able to do a program where we could have many, if not all of the theaters commit to being climate positive um, using estimates. So you could probably, for example, um, uh, have a tick the box thing backed by data that said um, uh, a, a, a show should offset 1500 tons um, and know that for some shows that would be 50% positive. Some shows it would only be 20% positive, but it's the extremely rare show where that wouldn't be positive to some degree. So um, I'd, I, if this is intriguing, I'd love to continue the conversation because um, uh, uh, climate, we're, we're making a big stand and, and are working to try to get everybody to make the stand that we better than not harm, we have to actually start healing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to talk more about that, Charlie. That, that is absolutely the direction we need to be going in. So I love that. And yes, let, let's talk more for sure. Great. Thank you all. All right. Uh, stage manager Molly is aware of the time and um, we are going to wrap up here. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing with us, sharing your insights um, and these incredible, uh, the incredible work you are doing. Um, I, we will send a wrap up email with all of the information so you can keep following Earth Angel and your incredible work. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for putting that in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, that's great. Join us again. We're back. Season two is back. We're here every Thursday. Um, so next week we will be uh, featuring Charles De Segundo on, um, and he is a financial expert. We're digging into finance. Um, and I'm going to, you told me the right things. This is how to uh, use your investments to take climate action. Um, following that, the next week, we will actually not be hosting a green quarantine because we will be hosting a virtual town hall on Monday, September 21st, the kickoff of Climate Week NYC. We will be launching it with Playbill.com, and 
countless other partners. Uh, you can go to our website for more information. It will be on voter mobilization. It's a town hall, lights up on voter mobilization. We hope to see all of you there 8 p.m. Eastern. And then join us the following week. We will be, uh, Lauren Patton will be hosting a, um, a green quarantine with global youth, youth activists from all around the world. It is sure to be inspiring. Uh, so if you need to pick me up, definitely join us for that one. And the following week will be on climate storytelling with Chantal Bilodeau of the Arctic Cycle. Um, so hope to see all of you there. Until then, have a wonderful week and take care, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks, Emily. Emily. Thank you all. Thank you, Molly. Take care. Thank you.